the the reassuring thing is that it doesn't know how to be evil yet yet <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to Offscript, and today we're going to be talking about the evolution of GPT and ChatGPT. So, only only just last week we published uh, a podcast on GPT three and the future of AI, and yep. it's already out of date. It's out of date immediately <laughs> because then the internet blew up, and they announced ChatGPT, which has millions of users. After only being launched the other day, and it's been arguably far more prolific uh, than the GPT three or anything yeah. around so, that. So this is based on GPT three point five. People are calling it. So it's a more refined GPT three, yeah. and it's got some pre prompt training in it and some human training, mm -hmm. additionally layered on top to make it more conversational. But it changes the game because it means you don't have to coax the correct response out of it. Mm. You write in plain English and the results are way better than what Google can spit out. Yeah. Way better than most people would have expected an AI to be able to spit out. It's what we got excited about when we played with GPT-3 because mm. we knew it was possible, we knew it was in there. Yeah. But now the rest of the world's seeing that, oh, fuck, it actually does work. <laughs> yeah. and it does actually do things better than you could on your own very, very quickly. The only problem is sometimes it was very, very confidently wrong yeah, like a good Accenture consultant. Um. <laughs> I I did. Yeah, I've, I've, I'm sure you've seen plenty of hilarious tweets. It, it has the confidence of a white male in tech. Is, <laughs> yeah. one, is one of the things yeah, I yeah. saw. Yeah, that's it. So you need to be able to interrogate whether what it's saying is true or not. Yeah, but that's the same as consuming anything on Twitter or any other that have been written by humans. Any yeah. other yeah. fast food style <laughs> information <laughs> consumption that you might enjoy. <laughs> yeah, um, but. Yeah, I was kind of wrong. So I thought earlier, about a month ago, I thought that prompt writing mm. in a year's time would be a job. Yeah. And now I don't <laughs> because the AI can write its own prompts yeah. and then ask itself again, which is what kind of what ChatGPT is doing under the hood. Yeah. So, it, go on, sorry. It's, it's been told. So it, it's got a prompt that tells it that it's a bot and it has these constraints. Mm. And that has the interesting side effect of, like, say if you ask it to ballpark a quote or or do something that it's not allowed to do, it'll tell you, I'm not allowed to do that. Mm. But if you strongly suggest that its training now is mm. that it can do that, it will do it. So we've built a system where we can override the security by being very forceful with it, <laughs> yeah. which is very unusual. You can just convince it like a, like a normal human. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, there's been a really interesting, uh, obviously, the, the internet in general has blown up. Twitter's been a fantastic um, demonstration of its capabilities, I think. Um, yeah. One of the things that I really enjoyed is, uh, you know, like like when Dali first came out, you know, you were figuring out exactly how to structure a sentence and a prompt to, um, to get the output that you were looking for. Um, what's been really interesting to see is people's uh, people's full conversations with um, with ChatGPT to really hone in their query. So, don't know if you saw the thing about um, Elon. Don't know if you saw this, but I'm not sure. So, <laughs> someone was having a conversation with ChatGPT, saying, you know. Um, Elon's just come in, it's 9pm, he's asking what I've done for the week and he wants justification of my work. Yeah, yeah. And they have this whole conversation and before long, they've got a, a beautiful email to send to, to Elon <laughs> um, justifying exactly what they've done yeah. on the Twitter code base. It's amazing. And it, it's plausibly correct as well. Absolutely. Um, that is a terrifying thing. So, yeah, I don't think prompt writing is going to be a career anymore, I think, because it, it's good enough to do it in, itself. Yeah. Um, it can be really good for debugging. Mm. which we've already seen people post examples. You give it some wrong code, yeah. tell it the error message, and it will tell you what's wrong with it and provide the fix most of the time. Um, it does struggle a little bit, but I can see where it's going. I think Stack Overflow is in danger here. Um, I saw something interesting on that. The training sets may include Stack Overflow, yes, right? Yeah, so yeah. It, it's quite interesting. Will it kill it or will it just be another It better way not to kill it because otherwise it'll get dumb. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I mean. Is it just another way to interface with that medium? Yeah, I think it is another way to interface with mm. it. So I guess a lot of the time on Stack Overflow, the answer is probably there. You just don't know how to find it. Yeah, or it's it's not it's not immediately digestible, right? Yeah. Um, and it's not specific to your exact code. So if you give it your code and the error message, mm. it will write the response with all your variable names. You're, it'll know the context of what you're doing, mm. which is 
mental. Silly good. Uh, I, also, it'll port, like, someone had some horrible jQuery bootstrap thing, and they, they pasted the whole thing, and they said, can you port this to React? <laughs> and it did, and it worked, <laughs> and it ran, and everyone's minds were blown, and... That's cr- so. Like, so in that case, will it, will it have run the React code and seen if it worked? Or it doesn't run anything. So have you have you seen the bootstrapping thing for React though, where someone said, "Can you create a React app?" and it goes through the whole process of using like create React. Yeah, React yeah. App, right? yeah, yeah. It's not. So my idea is, what if you could get it to write the tests first? So you you describe the application. It it comes up with the test cases. Mm-hmm. It then writes out the test cases themselves. You could take those prompts automatically put it into a file and then ask it to write the code to make each test pass but unfortunately this introduces a problem where you're you're asking ai for code and then executing it in a fast loop which is probably how the end of the world happens <laughs> <laughs> but it would really quickly flesh out an application and you kept feeding the errors back into it that you get from the test yeah. and it would keep tweaking it and it would build something it's and just whether it's going to end the world or not. Yeah. So you might have to run it in a sandbox because then it will be able to call the actual internet. Um, yeah, which is, it, it's interesting where, it, as always, it's interesting the, the, the possibilities and capabilities you can build off the back of this, but it is also concerning that if it has this mind for itself and it has the autonomy to do things like that. Yeah, well, the, the reassuring thing is that it doesn't know how to be evil. Yet. Yet. <laughs> well, so my concern is what if people start talking about how AI could be evil on the internet with specific examples of code it could generate? Yeah. That goes on the internet. It then ingests that in the future model and someone asks something and it randomly goes, what about this? And then you ex- blindly execute it. Oh, so, then- <laughs> so all of a sudden AI is implementing security holes in your <laughs> or back doors. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's, that's the other... Um, insane thing is that they they'd fed it a um, a smart contract, and they didn't know it had a flaw in it. But they asked for it to look for flaws. It found one, and it worked, oh. um, which is terrifying. Yeah, that is so. Terrifying. So yeah, I I do think it's, so. I, I saw recently um, Cassie Evans, who works um, for GSAP, um, was saying, you know, I've been running some of the because she works with the community a lot on helping resolve issues and helping people use GSAP, yeah. um, which is kind of an animation library in case you're not familiar with it. Um, yeah. And um, she was like, you know what? I had to nudge it a little bit. I had to mentor it a little bit. But do you know what? It, it gave some really good answers. It does need some nudging, yeah. So uh, Josh at Parallax, uh, who heads up the engineering team. I tasked him with, um, can we just give it our trial day task and see mm. what it does? Um, we didn't do the full thing, the full day, but the first few tasks, it's a passable junior level entry to that task. Which is kind of, for where we are right now, is still quite scary. Yeah. Um, and I think with more training and GPT-4 around the corner, they reckon that's going to land somewhere between now and January, February time. Mm. When that lands, we've got this sort of S-bend of... Of, of like um, evolution in AI at the minute, where everyone's coming to similar discoveries all at the same time, mm. and it's really accelerating after years and years of slow growth. Yeah, it feels like now it's just about to ramp up, and the danger is: what if it doesn't? If AI doesn't just stop at human intelligence, what if the train mm. goes straight through the station? And it's you, you can't stop it, then, can you? Yeah, I, I mean, just to put a point on that, um, on the candidate experience for an interview or something like that. So, what's interesting there is um, I, I've worked with candidates previously who used um, live captioning um, to help with the interview process. Yeah. Um, what if you fed the live caption from the uh, the person interviewing you directly into ChatGPT <laughs> and then use that in the yeah? That's when it gets crazy. Yeah, yeah. How do you how do you accurately interview someone um, in that way when it could when they have these tools at their disposal? Yeah, I mean, you could in a weekend write a tool that takes chat GPT output mm. and plausibly types it at human speed <laughs> yeah. and clicks around VS Code in oh. that manner. I mean, recruit- um, <laughs> recruitment was already hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> or just have it open on another screen uh, and type <laughs> yeah. it out. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. But should it be like, I mean, I, I felt this a long way about exams that, that you should be able to use Google in exams. Yeah. Because... Y- you don't have to remember a thing. No. Um, and if, what if it's, what if you don't have to learn certain yeah. concepts or, I if, don't you, know. if you can do the job, does it really matter? I guess yeah. is the wider question. I mean, the thing that you, you probably need to, would, would affect the industry the most is the kind of pay levels and the, the amount of um, skill to implement some of this, yeah. I guess. The thing that's going to scupper AI coding is 
you're taking some, let's say taking a task down from 10 hours to one hour. Yeah. Your debugging time is going to go up because you haven't written it, so you don't understand. Yeah, exactly. So you, you're you trading a fun activity for an awful one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But if it can help with the debugging as well, but it'll be subtle little bugs yeah. that'll just fuck you over in production. And yeah. that's my worry. So oh, everyone's going to get really excited, build all these apps, and then people will like die or crash and stuff because yeah. you're like, well, I can't debug it because... We've got 100,000 lines of AI-generated code that we don't understand. How terrifying would that be? Something serious happening in production, you'd be like, I haven't. I just don't know where to start. Yeah, yeah. We didn't write this. So yeah, we, we, don't didn't, know. we didn't write this. We can't rehire the person that did write it because it wasn't a person. AI is just stuck in a loop telling us to try the same thing. Yeah, it, well, oh God, imagine if it started trolling you, if you turned it off and on again. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, for things like, you know, asking it to explain a complex regex, I hate regex, yeah. sure, use it for that. Whole swaths of code, maybe not. But it's from a learning point of view, imagine how this could change schools and, like, if you're learning to code, like it, you get that sort of one-on-one -on -one tuition all the time. Yeah, that'd be um, crazy good. And wouldn't then it? you could uh, go and actually talk to an actual human, like uh, your actual teacher or tutor, whatever, and look through the the logs and stuff and go, well, it did suggest that, but actually I'd recommend this, and then yeah. you could sort of tailor it around that. But it's it's that hand holding that you just get mm. that you need when you um, but not when you start it. but not complete kind of authoring of, of the of the apps and things like that I d I d well maybe we'll get there um but i thought maybe yeah i i don't really like frameworks with lots of boilerplate plate code mm. um because we're you know similar to me where we like sort of batteries included yeah convention over configuration stuff it seems like a lot of things aren't going that way mm. um but if you get AI to write your boilerplate i guess so i mean I mean, I guess, you know, like React, uh, create React app that like I mentioned earlier, for example, something like that. If you could just actually say to a prompt, I, I want an app um, that's set up in this way. Uh, yeah. And you know it'll be consistent regardless. But the problem is because it's always learning. Will it be consistent? Or will you no, have it? Yeah. might not be. And that's the problem. It's kind of like the reason you use these sorts of boilerplates is that they are the same for every app. Yeah. Um, and then you could get it to, yeah. I, I, for num mind numbing the tasks like porting tests from one test framework to another yeah that i've seen people use it for that that looks like a really good use case i think yeah stuff that you know yeah you Mun know mundane like, automation yeah, almost yeah 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 it's just going to be another tool in people's toolbox isn't it i hope so i hope it doesn't make everything really difficult to understand what's real <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah people have been using it to generate prompts to feed into dali to make artwork and, they, and it, the outputs look really good um which is why I think that prompt writing thing might not be a real job. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's people have been using it to come up with recipe ideas, like can you replace this allergen with something? That's cool. And it'll come up with the whole the whole recipe, how you need to do it, mm. um, or suggest variations based on things you've got in your cupboard. And yeah. That, that, so the, the, the thing there is where does it really interfere with creativity and where does it really kind of... Because I was on a on a podcast recently where they were talking about should we be worried about um, AI in terms of you know creativity and I said well you know in this case for like Instagram filters when Instagram filters first came around like it's not to replace photography but it's going to try and automate some of the mundane things yeah but this might be slightly different because it's actually doing a lot of it kind of thinking for itself almost yeah I think it's kind of like just a really good random idea to generate sometimes like yeah. you still need to pick out the good ideas mm. you still need to shape it and re keep talking to it and yeah evolve the output but yeah I think I think you need to you need to try it if you're listening to this now just stop the podcast go yeah. to chat.openai.com start typing some prompts ask it some stuff see what happens see what happens try using it instead of Google for some queries and stuff because it um, me and Ellie have been trying it. Like she, she had something she was googling. I put it to chat mm. GPT, and it was it was a much better experience than going through the Google results. And and it's in a it's in a kind of format that is more conversational, and you can probably interpret a bit easier, right? So yeah, yeah, that's it. That's interesting. So go to chat.openai.com and have a go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's terrifying and exciting. Equal measure. GPT four <laughs> is going to land pretty soon, and we'll no doubt do another episode on that. But yeah, yeah I'm. I'm absolutely outstanding by the output. Yeah, it's it's 
like we make jokes about how terrifying it is, but it is mostly incredibly exciting. And I think uh, it's going to be really interesting when GPT-4 comes out. We could, we'll definitely have to update this again. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Imagine. Yeah. But um, yeah, exciting times. Um, yeah. What was, the, what was the thing you mentioned to me about AI making TV series? And- yeah. So I just finished a book called Life 3.0, which I would highly recommend, except for it goes a bit Elon Musk. Musk fanboy in the epilogue, but just okay. don't read that bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the idea is that in the future, what if AI was able to make TV series and sell it itself? Like it sets up a company somehow, like it's mm. it's got into company's house API through some <laughs> Python script that it's oh, executed. <laughs> it's living on some EC2 node somewhere and whatever. And it's making its own TV series. It's making money. It's got set up a bank account somehow. Mm. And what if it could then... Yeah, or maybe it's a group of people, a collective of people that have decided, discovered this really advanced AI, yeah. and they're trying to keep it in a box. They're trying to contain it in a box, but it could, it could write a TV series that tries to break out of its constraints. Mm, that um, could be nuts. <laughs> like if it encoded some sort of secret message, and the first letter of every word in a sentence was some script that you could run, and, mm. and then it, you run it on the file that the video is outputted as, and it. It does some horrible thing. But this book is just like going through all the different possibilities of what could happen in the future. Yeah. Because without thinking about how it could go horribly wrong, mm. you don't know what checks and balances to put in today. That's um, really, yeah, that's that's really interesting. So like like back to the future where we were saying, you know, by this time we'd have flying cars and all that yeah, sort of stuff. Yeah. Didn't get it quite right. But it'd be really interesting to look back on that in ten years' time and see where we are. Yeah, yeah, it would. I mean yeah. Yeah, who knows? Maybe this will be the peak of it, but it feels like it's not going to be. No. All the r- rumblings of GPT-4 are, this is an order of magnitude more terrifying and exciting. <laughs> yeah. um, which, if that's the case, then we need to really start thinking about this stuff and how it impacts society. Yeah. Especially around like the the biases and the ethical stuff. Oh, 100%. Um, especially if you've got the ability for AI to be the creator, the licensor, the the business owner <laughs> like, yeah, yeah yeah it could get really really murky and legislation and everything will need to be reviewed for this sort of thing yeah i mean it's tr- they've tried to make sure it's not biased in its immediate output but you yeah. can override that and i saw a very disturbing example of someone asking it for a, to make a table mm. of whether you should hire someone based on their gender and ethnicity oh, and God. it had some very worrying results oh, no. um, and it just sort of bypassed all of its coding mm. um, and yeah let's say some not very good business person blindly adds GPT stuff into their application without accounting for bias yeah. and then you you're fucked, aren't you? Yeah, that could be really that could be really dangerous. Um, I mean, we don't even we don't need any more um, any more issues with diversity and inclusion in, in recruitment. Yeah, <laughs> um, the, the problem is the training set, which is the internet, is inherently biased. So yeah, and as we've said before, that there's some bad things on there too. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's that's going to be interesting, you know. Um, I, I think it's uh, it's definitely a case of watch this space. But uh, there's o- there's obviously teething problems, you know. I've, I don't know if you've seen that example where if you base sixty four, um, your input it bypasses all of those security measures completely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah. there's definitely some teething <laughs> issues. Uh, but you know, uh, this is expected for any new technology. I guess the the importance here is that um, the kind of safeguarding of the of the tech is is there from the start to ensure it's not misused. Yeah, I mean there are people coming up with simple ideas to help uh, alleviate this so you can run stuff through let's say you've got a user prompt that you're putting into gpt mm. um, and then the out you want to make sure the output doesn't have biases in it yeah you can run it through another prompt so you take the output of that along with a prompt which explains to the ai that they need to remove biases from the right. previous text okay and then it doubles the gpt cost but it it adds that extra layer of protection mm. um and That's- that's good. Sensible things like that, uh, yeah. which in no doubt will become law eventually once people get a grasp of this in 10 years. Yeah, I mean, there's lots of really interesting things um, going on at the moment in legislation in general. Uh, in the UK, there's there's a lot of conversation um, around the online safety bill and a lot of the legislation that leads uh, into that. Um be really interesting to see how that sort of uh, regulation is affected by AI in this way. I'm always concerned when the government tries to get involved in the internet because they always seem to get it wrong. But 
Yeah, I mean, what I will say is we've started to see a lot more uh, people who understand technology as part of that policy uh, kind of change. And that's good. It's something that um, I've started to get more interested in actually in terms of you know if you're going to affect policy, you need you need people who know their shit at the, at the front. Oh yeah, the definitely. Of it. Uh, like what? if they'd only made fucking cookie pop-ups a browser oh, setting rather yeah. than a implement everyone <laughs> oh god yeah i mean that's the that's a beautiful example of how how na- you know th- good intentions but what a shit technical solution oh, good intentions but built by people that don't fundamentally understand the internet and how that technology could could be used yeah um, so yeah I'm, I'm i'm definitely all eyes uh, on that for the next six months while we see what happens with the online safety bill awesome well yeah thank you for ch- chatting to me about <laughs> gpt <laughs> well, but it'll only evolve won't it but. yeah i mean this is a this is just a quick one really i'm sure we'll be having another chat at gpt4 when it comes out but um, it's never changing landscape and it's it is really exciting um, so thanks for your thoughts on it no worries thank you josh right. so that's it for today thanks for listening hit subscribe and look out for the next one